participate in the chair of these sessions. Uh, my name is Chris Wilson. I'm the director of the uh, European Union Centre of RMIT. But uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Pascaline Levon, uh, from the Monash Europe and European Union Centre, really deserves the glory for putting on the seminar because it's her centre that has done the last bulk of the organisation to, to get us all here today. Um, this is a, a terrific event for us. But it, it, there are three European Union centres in Australia, one at ANU, one at Monash and one at RMIT. And uh, the, the uh, intent always is that we, we cooperate with each other, but it's not always to do. We're in three very different universities, universities that actually do compete with each other, such as the state of higher education these days. And, uh, and so making cooperation happen is something that we always strive for but don't necessarily do well. I think you're very lucky because you're here from a event where, where the cooperation uh, uh, really comes through to the finest. Uh, ANU, you can see as well, is one of the, the cooperating centres uh, with us. And we have uh, some ANU colleagues here with us who will be uh, presenting to you during the, the uh, school. So, uh, welcome. I, I trust that you share my enthusiasm for the kind of conversation and discussion we're going to have in the next couple of days and uh, look forward very much to getting to know you a little bit. Um, you're all teachers. You're, uh, you're at the heart of the, the business of learning. Um, we're teachers in our own way, uh, but, but university folk, as you know, have a, have a uh, real predilection for, for thinking that we are the, the best ones to be telling you what you should be learning. And uh, um, so we're going to try and manage the program so that we give you plenty of chance to learn from, from key scholars in the various fields that we have available, but also provide time for you to be asking questions, making comments, and providing feedback. If at any point you want to have a chat to me about the dynamic, about how the process is actually working, look, please don't hesitate to do so. We're trying to just keep that balance between giving you the, the, uh, the opportunity to, to hear from these people and at the same time bring your own stamp and your own particular interests into play. So, so please don't hesitate. Uh, as I say, at any point, have a word with me if, if you'd like to uh, uh, draw something out about the process. Um, this, this, uh, the overall program covers a, covers a number of different topics, a number of different aspects of Europe in itself, what is Europe, uh, as well as Europe in the world and Europe in relation to Australia. Uh, one of the great things about working in an EU centre at the present time, as you all know, is that the last couple of years have been pretty uh, significant times for Europe. Uh, about every 20 years or so, it seems that the European Union managed to encounter a, uh, a crisis, a and, and typically in those times of crisis, there is a, an enormous amount of commentary which indicates that Europe is finished. That in one way or another, that Europe is the old world, that it's uh, uh, no longer able to deal with the challenges of, of uh, contemporary economic, uh, cultural, political forces, and that uh, we look to other developed parts of the world, like Asia, like Brazil, uh, as being where the, the shape of uh, the, the future might be found. But the reality is that, that in each of the periods of, of crisis that Europe has encountered, uh, it has also been a period of, of enormous firming in, in thinking through what those challenges are and how Europe, the European Union, can best position itself to move from crisis into a much more constructive and capable role in the world. And I, I personally believe that that's very much what we're seeing happening at the present time. It's not an easy process, it's not a simple process. One of the things that's very different about the European Union is that uh, if you compare it with a, a nation state like Australia, government is very much a, a hidden process. There are all the corridor conversations, there's the, the kind of debates and lobbying that goes on inside caucus, inside party rooms, and, and we get kind of uh, often the, the formal statements by, by party leaders uh, afterwards and the occasional lift, which adds a bit of spice. In the case of the European Union, every meeting they have is, is publicly scheduled, is publicly known when, the, when the, uh, the leaders of the various member states are going to meet. And it's not a surprise that in the space of one 24-hour period, they don't, don't actually solve all of the problems that Europe faces. They come out and say, we're still working on this. And that's taken to be a, a sign of, uh, of a crisis. But the reality is that what the European Union leaders are dealing with at the present time is enormously complex, enormously interesting, and to my eye, enormously important for all of us. Uh, so I hope you see these three days as a chance to really get to grips with, with some of the, the, uh, the forces and the issues that are shaping Europe at the present time 
and leave with a, a better uh, understanding perhaps of the role of the European Union can play in the future world that we will all be part of. So, welcome. Let me now hand over to, to Pascaline. Uh, Pascaline, as I say, is a Professor and Director of the, the Centre at Monash University and, and uh, Pascaline will be providing a much more erudite uh, commentary on some of the things I've just been saying in her opening comments about what is Europe. Welcome, Pascaline.
possible task, of course, to talk about what is Europe uh, in 20 minutes. So the way I thought I would approach this is to look at part of Europe and ask ourselves have, what is the EU. But even better, I would not have enough this 20 minutes. So what I decided to do uh, is to present a tool that would be useful to you and that we've been developing over the years. So there's not going to be too much talk, but this is something that's been actually tested. Uh, and um, the first version of this PowerPoint I'm going to present was developed by an intern at the center. Why did we ask the intern at the center to do that? Because we felt that it was younger, closer to students, you know, in secondary school, so we'd probably do a better job than a professor like me who complicates things, you know, not uh, uh, <laughs> be the right person to, to present uh, uh, in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in secondary school. So um, then uh, the delegation of the EU got interested and so did the Australian government and we received a little bit of funding to send Aurelia to Canberra and present this in schools and also it was presented uh, in several schools uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Melbourne uh, not just by Aurelia but also by our master students uh, so, so this is the history of it and if you see three names that because it's, that it's because uh, I developed it further and then one of our interns developed it further again and what you can do is add down your names and make this a flexible tool to use with your students, perhaps. And so this is, this is the idea. So I won't speak to the whole PowerPoint, but just to you. Uh, so first, you start by saying who you are. Uh, so, of course, Aurelien was French, but I'm Belgian, so here it is. But a lot of you, perhaps, have European ancestors, so you can start with that, perhaps, and talk about your own connection. So I'm Belgian, I'm European, uh, father from of the three friends of Belgium, those who get into all of this, uh, mother from France and Austria, and even taught in various countries. This is the next thing you can do. You can show a map, you know, of the practical view of countries you can come from. This is an adaptive we do, and uh, I believe it's on the you know, USB Venice box. Then you approach the distance between Europe and Australia, you can talk about that. Uh, is there a problem of uh, distance? Uh, and then uh, you uh, tell your student this is a long relationship, you know, uh, when did Europeans come to Australia, and you to try to explain this. Um, talk about European immigration then. Um, and then uh, it's a good idea perhaps to say that 70% of Australians can claim European ancestry. Perhaps in the classroom you can start a discussion with us to see you know, if, what's the background of your students. And talk about uh, you know who is moving where you know, uh, every year. Uh, if you want to find good information to update any of this, DFAT is a very good website. So that's one of the sources you can use. But there are many others. Um, and then you try to explain, as Bruce did a little bit earlier, that it's it's not enough uh, to talk about the EU. Uh, that it's not really a state. And you try to explain what it is. It's not Europe either. It's much broader than that. And we can do this map that shows. Of course, that there are separate ways of living in Europe. Um, it has 27 member states, it's 28, so yeah, it's not easy to arrive at a decision in all these member states. And then you show that there are big member states, weekly member states, you know, and then uh, big member states, you can talk about the dynamics here. Um, um, and then uh, there are several institutions. The EU is very much based on institutions or groups. So there are many of these institutions, many policies as well. The agricultural one is probably the one that uh, Australia is very familiar with, but not in a positive way, but there are also positive ones, like the environmental policy, for example. Many players as well. Um, and then uh, for your students, we could also talk about European Union symbols. Uh, so there is the one that we by Beethoven. You can play it. I don't have the link here, but I've put it there. So if you want to play it, and those students can do that. Uh, and then you can talk about the Euro list if you want. Um, and these, uh, the one on the right there uh, is a statue that you can find in, uh, in front of the European Parliament in, in Luxembourg. And so there are regular exhibits you know, in Brussels or Luxembourg about uh, the uh, 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 The 12 uh, stars, again, there's a whole story behind that. If you want, you can expand on that. Why 12 stars or 27, 28 member states? Why is that? Uh, Europe Day, what is it all about? 
uh, there are celebrations uh, every year commemorating that, where, you know, as you, whether you're here or in Brussels or in India, for example. Um, so this is one thing we could talk about. It's uh, the, to commemorate the uh, celebration of the, the Schumann Declaration, uh, when Robert Schumann, the French uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, you know, launched, I guess, the, the first proposal to create the first European community. Then that, uh, Moto in academic diversity, there are a lot of colorful uh, posters you can find. Why the European Union? So this question, and then we have a good discussion with your, your students. Um, of course, if you talk about the EU, it's not just about peace, it's about war as well. Now. It, it was, uh, I guess you could say that the EU is all about trying to, <laughs> to, uh, to find peace in this domino that's been ravaged by the world many, many times. And <coughs> that the United Europe is not a good idea, you can go back in time. So why did it uh, materialize uh, at that particular point in time? It's another discussion. Um, why Europe? It's also because Europe uh, has to fit in in a globalized world. It had to adapt. Uh, it makes it possible uh, as if you uh, United Europe to compete with other economic uh, giants like USA, Japan, China, Uh, you have also have uh, challenges that you cannot tackle on your own, like uh, organized crime, uh, crime or terrorism, for example. And it's also a way to defend certain values, like the rule of law, human rights, and peace. And then you can look at the historic steps. Uh, so the first one, creation of the European policy community, only six countries, so the today has been happening. Why are we calling speed? Um, so that's, I guess, what you can discuss with your students. Then you make it interactive. So you have a map, and they have to place those countries uh, on, on the map. I just use a stick, it's very good technology. <laughs> it works very well. Um, so those, they usually get right, by the way, and that's all. And then it gets more complicated later. Uh, then you show the Treaty of Paris, with all the foreign affairs ministers mostly signed the treaty. Uh, and then you go to the treaties of Rome, the European Economic Community, Euratom, that was about uh, the Pacific use of uh, atomic energy. Um, and then the community expanding to nine member states. The United Kingdom joins in <coughs> after two failed attempts. That could spark you know, a good discussion with your students uh, because it had implications for Australia. <coughs> but not just for Australia. Uh, uh, then, of course, you place those on the map. They usually get good right as well, but not always. Then you talk about European Parliament. There was a European Parliament, because we called that right from the beginning, uh, but it gained more and more power. Today, uh, it's, it's very powerful, actually, as evidenced by all the lobbies to, to try to have access to the Parliament. So, you know that as well. And then you say, okay, now you enlarge to Mediterranean countries. What are the consequences then uh, for, uh, for the EU and for the world as well? But it means, in this case, the degree that there are going to be more links with Latin America. So each time the EU enlarges, uh, it changes the so things. Um, then we talk about the single market, um, the political involved. So it's really some key events, but this is you know uh, to start a discussion. So it's very simple at this stage. Treaties, yes, of course, yes, the EU has a succession of, of treaties as well. That's really based on that. Uh, now an extension to some of the Nordic member states also. Austria, what does it do? In this case, for example, uh, it led to more attention being paid to transparency in the decision making and also more attention to environmental. <coughs> Again. And then you talk about the euro, you don't not talk about the euro. Uh, these days it's very much in the news, of course, because of the crisis as well. Uh, but you can actually bring euro notes and coins to those who like this. So we can have a little game as well and try to guess, you know, what is the value of one euro, uh, how much does a French baguette cost, for example. So a little game. We can look here, a tiny string ticket. And then the big, big enlargement to some more, 10 more countries. Then you could argue that actually one of the most successful policies uh, of the foreign policies of the EU would be enlargement. 
passive binary. And uh, again, you could discuss this. So there it becomes more complicated. They don't always get this right. <laughs> and so we try to increase their advantage. And two new countries, to say, seven, and then And that's the, the map of the US. There are better maps as well. They, they <coughs> um, and then you uh, ask yourself, how do you become a member of this US community? Is it difficult? And yes, it's become more and more difficult over time. So you can just explain some of the political, the, the economic, and legislative uh, criteria. How does it work? Many, many different languages. That causes difficulties as well. Um, so we can have a lot of about this as well. Um, and then you look at the various institutions, and the council, you have state representative, a rotating presidency, the European Council, and there you might recognize some of the, you know, the characters there. They usually recognize, uh, I guess, um, uh, Germany uh, and France. Uh, you can talk uh, perhaps also about the way perhaps whether women are well represented there. And these are the head of states or government of EU member states. He's also the president of the European Commission, uh, president of the European Council, and the high representative for foreign affairs. So I'm sorry, they're not very photogenic, but this is the best I could do. If you're so lucky, they are here. But they're very competent, but they're not very photogenic. So and then you have the European <coughs> Parliament. So again, uh, it doesn't have just one location, it has three. Does it create problems for the poor parliamentarians? Yes, sometimes they lose the documents and move it from one location to the next. So for an anthropologist, this is very interesting to, to study all the movement of the institution to the other. Then you have the European Commission, uh, but also it's more well known when we came to Australia in 2011. And then you have other institutions that want to talk to that. What does the EU do? Here you can look at separate policies. I picked the common agricultural policy for, for obvious reasons, but you could get many other different policies. Uh, citizens Europe, how do you move within the EU? Um, well, uh, within the Schengen zone, you know, they need to do a passport uh, in the world, right? So you can explain this to your students. Uh, if you go to Europe, what happens to you concretely? When you are in So I put more details here. Uh, and you can talk about the Erasmus. That, that's uh, another thing you can do. Erasmus is a great program that allows students you know, to spend some time in another university in Europe. But actually now there is uh, Erasmus Mundus, where uh, you can also, uh, as an Australian student, spend some time in Europe, and then you know, uh, European students can come here uh, uh, as well. And we have a number of our students. Uh, I, I, I find the, the, you know, the fifth floor in the Asian building and the one should be empty these days because a lot of them are actually spending time uh, in universities in Europe. So it's great, but so, so anyway, so that's, that's another thing you could look at. Then you can talk about the links between Europe and Australia. Uh, I won't go into all the details, this is for, for you to use uh, here. So economic links, um, how important is the in Australia? In terms of business investment uh, in trade, it's important to Australia to, uh, to Europe. Uh, try to look perhaps uh, beyond uh, the numbers on official websites. And it's an interesting story to, to your students. Um, so here are some of the things that came up with. There's other cooperation besides uh, trade and investment, there's political environment. Um, there's also cooperation specifically in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, cooperation. Um, and then you can talk about the incarnation of this, you know, into, for instance, uh, the uh, Australian European Union partnership framework. Uh, there's also a treaty under negotiation. Um, and what does it all cover? It's a very comprehensive document you know, that covers all kinds of uh, aspects of the, the relationship. Um, the contact, who is coming to, what are the official visitors who come to Australia? Um, well, um, this year is very, well, last year was very important because for the 50th anniversary of Australian uh, EU relations, so the delegation of the EU uh, put up a lot of different uh, uh, events uh, for this. So um, you can talk about this if you want. Um, you can also talk about uh, visits of Julie Killer to Brussels, 
or Barroso, can we be here, or Burns, or the officials. There's a, a big flow of officials uh, going back and forth between Australia uh, and the EU. Uh, this is, and uh, all of the EU centers of Atlantis were there, this is when uh, the president of the European Commission, uh, Barroso, came uh, to Canberra and he made a speech. Hillary also made a, a speech. And they were, of course, discussing collaboration between uh, Australia and the EU, and particularly uh, a treaty between 